This conference will now be recorded. All right. Welcome, everybody. This is <clears throat> week three already. Do you believe that? No. Nope. Here's what this week looks like. Here we are in the live session Monday. Uh, this week, you're going to complete a, an identity package. You have one assignment, basically, which is a 6.0 brand identity and color palette. Um, so although it's one assignment, there's a lot packed in there. So um, you're going to start working on your identity package and color palette. I'm going to provide live critiques on Wednesday at noon. Um, you're going to post your work as you have it so far on Thursday for the discussion. And then uh, Friday, you're going to provide a peer critique to a classmate. This is how it goes every week. Um, I will, uh, in my section, I will endeavor to provide a video uh, feedback as well. I hope that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> based on the feedback and what you learned uh, this week, you'll complete that identity package for Sunday. Um, so in a sense, it's really not quite as much work as you've been doing. So it's been pretty strenuous uh, last week, I know. Uh, this week uh, sort of evens out a little bit, and then next week it'll, it'll be even better. So <clears throat> I'm glad we've got a good turnout. Uh, just to record the turnout, we've got <clears throat> Matt Penna, uh, Nick Badman, uh, Sahara, Willie, and Zachary all joining us. So great job, guys. Glad you're here. Any questions on the week schedule or stuff you got to do this week? Not so far. I can barely hear you, Sahara. Oh, how about now? A little better. Sorry, um, I'm actually on my lunch break at work, so finding a place with really good connections kind of tough. Ah, okay. Are you in a different time zone or you work at night? Um, no, I work like afternoons into the late evenings. Yes, I've done that many times. I'm doing it now. Um, <clears throat> I'm, almost, I'm also working too. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go through and uh, get you going. So tonight's lecture, I'm going to talk about identity package and color uh, palettes. So it's really intended to give you some inspiration as you go forward. Um, but there are videos and instructions in the assignment that help you do use the templates and, and how to do all that. So uh, I'm going to start off by talking about identity packages. Um, identity package is a unique term that we use in graphic design to describe business card, letterhead, and envelope. And it's typically done as part of a logo or identity uh, to sort of demonstrate proof of concept, like that you've actually created a brand that kind of works. Um, and this, this is a student example, so here's some business cards uh, by Miranda. Uh, what you get to do is create color, a color logo, and other elements that you get to use to create your brand. Um, and this sort of leads to a larger view of brand and identity, which um, we're just sort of touching on now, and you'll get into in much greater detail in upcoming courses. Um, but if you think about it, it really sort of expresses the brand idea. So the brand is kind of like the idea and the identity in general is the expression of that idea, how it gets put into, put ink to paper, so to speak. Uh, like if you think of Best Buy, those blue shirts with the yellow logo on it, you know they work there. You have a certain trust that they work there. Um, you know, the blue sign, the signage throughout the store has the same consistent blue. So that color helps to create consistency that makes us feel safe, like we can take out our credit card and buy something. Um, if you look at this, this is a project by Pentagram, a Michael Beirut for Bobby's Burger Palace. And you can see the logo looks like a burger. And there's a color palette sort of set up by this uh, with this yellow, red, and green. And it fl plays out throughout the interior of the store, of the restaurant. Uh, on the logo, of course, in the packaging, and even on the business card. So you can see <clears throat> how color ties it all together. And that's why we put this branding assignment into color theory, because uh, <clears throat> color is really an essential piece of it. Here's this company. I don't even know what they do. They're a Russian company. Uh, but you see how this presentation template, these banners, signage, uh, billboard, and even a printed piece all have what I would call a family resemblance. They feel like they go together, right? And uh, what do you what do you see that makes them feel like they go together? The color palette. 
Yeah, color palette for sure. Are there other elements that help it feel like it goes together? To the typeface? Yeah, there's certain consistency in the fonts. Uh, there's also, they're using these gradients uh, very consistently. So you see gradients everywhere, right? Yep. Uh, they use knockout white graphic symbols, arrows, percentages, right? And that's another way of doing it. So you're creating a, a, your own sort of visual language, uh, different elements that have a similar feel and work together. Here's the spoke trading company. So you see there's a sort of muted color palette here, but it still ties it all together. The photography has a very desaturated look, but they're type elements and this sort of wax seal type thing uh, and these kind of brown paper, it all starts to have a feel like it all goes together. So if you think of your brand as a person, you know, what kind of personality does it have? Uh, big brands sometimes have actual real people as their personality. Uh, in the case of these examples here, which one of these people went to jail? One, the front, Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, yeah, Martha Stewart went to jail. And yet she has uh, bounced back from that event quite successfully. She's a woman in charge of a billion dollar media company. Um, she uh, did so by being consistent with her brand image. She didn't complain about it, about being in jail. She didn't talk about it. She sort of moves on and she's like your friendly neighbor down the street who makes cupcakes. But meanwhile, she's a very powerful person and uh, understands the importance of brand consistency. Uh, recently, she did a thing with um, Snoop Dogg, which actually is, he has a certain brand consistency to him as well. And the fact that they both are so uh, established in their own brands means that it's a lot of fun to put them together and they work well together. Um, so how do you create identity? You're creating touch points. And when you think about touch points, you can think about any large company or big brand that you know of, like for instance, Disney, right? When I say Disney, what comes into your head? What image? Mickey Mouse. Yeah, Mickey Mouse, right away. Uh, and Disney is particularly uh, careful about the way they use Mickey Mouse. Um, and uh, But they use Mickey Mouse a lot. Just a silhouette is enough to sort of brand it. Um, Disney is a very large and complex brand, multiple entertainment entities, and uh, they are very slavish about making sure they keep their brand consistent in all its different forms. Uh, I had a friend who worked there and his job, he, they were coming up with the park hopper pass, which allowed you to go from park to park. Uh, and he wanted to use Tigger as the symbol of the park hopper pass. And they said, no, you can't use Tigger. He doesn't hop, he bounces. <laughs> That's the point? Yeah, that true. I said, you should have called it the park bouncer pass, but that didn't sound right, so. <laughs> yeah. um, here's another company and you see, they have like four divisions, These diff this uh, distinctive color palette, they use it uh, on signage, on the walls, on pencils. So it sort of creeps into every nick, nook and cranny of the brand. Uh, and this is your goal as you go forward with your identity package, sort of bring it all together. Uh, here's another Michael Beirut project, uh, Republic Records. What does that look like? Flag. That logo. Yeah, it looks like a flag, right? Uh, and the word Republic sort of makes you think of the flag and it's they're using black color palette. But these graphic elements, the stripes, uh, become a unifying element. And look, they even use on the hat. Um, so you can find additional graphic elements besides the color uh, that will also tie things together. There's website. You see how these stripes become a graphic element. Uh, all right, here's another Michael Beirut project, Lucy's Fried Chicken. What do you feel when you see Lucy's Fried Chicken? Would you eat there? Uh, seems kind of homey. I would eat there. Yeah. It seems homey, yeah. How would you describe this logo? I mean, is it uh, contemporary or nostalgic? I'll say nostalgic. Nostalgic. Yeah, yes. nostalgic. Yes, it's definitely nostalgic, you know, and uh, nostalgic, by the way, kind of works for restaurants. Uh, yeah, it reminds you of baseball, Nick. Yeah, it kind of does in some way. 
um, because uh, nostalgia works for restaurants because uh, most people uh, have a long-standing belief that food used to be better. You know, everybody's grandma made it better than it's made today, right? So we kind of have a nostalgia when it comes to food. Uh, here's the neon sign. Now, now, how do you feel about Lucy's Fried Chicken? Oh. Okay. I was not expecting that. So yeah. this kind of throws you off a little bit, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now so, you remind me of McDonald's. It what? Now it reminds me of McDonald's. McDonald's. Oh, so the neon kind of throws you off. It seems a little cheaper. Yes. Like McDonald's after dark. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there's a certain uh, sexual overtone here. Um, this image to me, because I'm older than you guys, looks like a pinup from the 1940s, like from World War II. Uh, so it has a certain kind of innocence to it that maybe you're not getting, but uh, definitely nostalgic and a little bit sinful and kind of playful, right? And to be honest, eating fried chicken isn't really good for you. So it's, you got to be a little sinful if you're going to go eat fried chicken, right? True. Uh, so I think they're playing off nostalgia and a little bit of hedonism. Um, and obviously she's sitting on a giant egg. So there's some kind of, it's kind of goofy and a little absurd, which I all think kind of works for a fried chicken restaurant in today's world where you're not supposed to eat fried food and all that. I also there's did not know that was an egg. <laughs> oh, the egg she was sitting on? Yeah, uh, yeah so, it. <laughs> Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, so there's <laughs> the full logo and there's the egg that kind of has the LC in it that they use as an additional element. Uh, you can see this kind of rustic wood pattern gives you a feel that it's old fashioned or something. Uh, there's a but picture I from the website. Feel the logo on their image does not go with that uh, neon sign. Yes. Okay. That's good. You're thinking about brand, so I like that. Um, a lot of strength comes from the consistency of the brand. If you think about it. Um, human relationships are based on consistency. If you have a friend who is inconsistent and they are in a different mood every day, uh, sometimes they're late for lunch and sometimes they're early, um, they forget your birthday, you're not gonna be friends with them for long, right? Inconsistency is hard for us to deal with. We tend to put up with it from family members, but friends, you know, it's like, you know, get with the program pull it together. The same is true for brands. If a brand is inconsistent, if it provides different things all, all the time, I feel nervous. I don't want to give them money. I'm worried. Um, this happened, believe it or not, to Target. Uh, Target uh, added a uh, garden center to some of their stores and people uh, weren't used to that and they didn't like it and it actually kind of hurt Target so they took it away. I, I think some of them are still around but so consistency is really important. So when you do graphic design, you're doing consistent design. This is the template which you're gonna use this week. So you're gonna do a letterhead, business card horizontal vertical, an envelope front and back. And this additional piece here is really sort of a little bonus thing we're giving you. If you wanted to assemble your own envelope, you could print it out and assemble it from this template, uh, but you don't need to use this for the assignment. So Front and back of the envelope, business card and letterhead. And that's what's due through to Sunday, the color palette and this. Um, as you work through it, you wanna coordinate all your designs, establish an image. You wanna express the spirit and personality of your brand. Uh, make sure it's appropriate for your target audience. Uh, make it sort of a system, you know? So you're using the same kind of graphic elements over and over again, uh, avoid fads. Um, and identify your company. Uh, let's look at some examples. All right, so this is a, an architect, and uh, these are well-designed uh, identity package. Uh, so this design firm, this is what they show as their portfolio. They show identity packages. Um, so this is something that you'll really need to do as a graphic designer is figure this out. So 
here's the letterhead. If you look, it's really a frame for a letter. An actual letter would go in the main space here. So you want the logo. You've worked so hard on your logos. Now you want it to be prominent, standing out up here in the corner, most likely. Um, there's other information. These are the locations. There's address information. It's neatly tucked away at the bottom, organized and clean, and it works. Now they've got this great color palette of this red and blue. They use the flood blue on the back of the page, uh, which is very expensive and nice. Um, if you look at the envelope, the logo is prominent. Probably the return address is on the back flap. That's a great way to do it. Uh, the business card, the logo is dominant. Next up, the person's name and title. All the other information is sort of grouped and pushed to the bottom. Uh, so you want to build a hierarchy here like this. On the back of this card, they use just the icon by itself, which is a cool thing to do. You can do that. This is like a note card, I think, with this SCD. Here's another architect, um, same design firm, and uh, you can see they've got this distinctive yellow color. So they made yellow, they use yellow paper for the envelope and the business card. Um, logo is king. Information organized, in this case, it's at the top. They did a blind embossing, which is like pressed into the paper with no ink of the logo icon. Um, and then on the business card, they put the logo on one side and all the info on the other, which is ex acceptable to do as well. If you see this envelope, there's the logo, and on the back is the return address. So you're organizing the information, you're making it look neat, you're using color, your color palette, and uh, you're trying to tie it all together. Uh, let's look at some other brand ideas. So here's Bone Daddy's. What's your feeling about Bone Daddy's? Would you eat there? It's a restaurant, obviously. I would. Willie says yes. Yep, I would. All right, I think Zach said nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right, Zach, tell us why. No, it's okay. Um, the the artwork is kind of for some reason just pushing me away. <laughs> I yeah. don't know why. So this artwork is very reminiscent of sort of primitive art from the Deep South, from like Louisiana and stuff. So uh, that's a deliberate reference to that kind of culture, which would be conducive to good barbecue. Mm. Yeah, but, <laughs> and if you're not familiar oh, I see with a skull it, on there, I don't know if I want that. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there's a certain edgy attitude here, right? For sure. Yeah. I think it's because of the fact that they added the the knife. The butcher's knife, yeah. Yes. And, and we're if, you're if you're a vegetarian, this ain't your place. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Not me, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, it definitely has, you know, the thing about good branding is it either, uh, you either love it or hate it. Uh, you know, if you try to be in the middle too much, you end up being uh, lost in the background. So sometimes uh, we used to say the essence of, tar of having a target audience is who is eliminating some people. You're not going to have everybody. Uh, you sort of have to figure out who your audience is and, and grab them. All right, this is a beer company, Swing Beer. What does this make you think of? Ice cream. Like carnival. Yeah, it looks like a carnival, right? What does a carnival have to do with beer? Craft. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, to me, this is well designed and branded, but with the wrong brand. I mean, I don't really, it doesn't really connect when I say, think of beer. This makes me think maybe it's cotton candy flavored beer, which would be disgusting. <laughs> uh, so it's important to be, to have the right brand, you know, not only design well and be clearly branded, but to have the right brand as well. All right, here's Kate Peters Photography. What can you tell me about her? doesn't tell anything about photography yes valentina it doesn't tell you anything it's well designed i mean it looks nice but there's nothing about there's nothing branded really so good design but not branded so uh, uh so the key is to figure out the right brand and design it well and uh have it stand out 
Uh, here's Carthage Stoneworks. What's the feeling you get from this? Kind of rustic and industrial. Yeah, it has a certain industrial feeling, but uh, it also uh, is kind of retro, right? Yeah. It kind of feels like old school. Oh, I yeah. mean, they've got this kind of stamp. It looks almost like a union logo from the 30s or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and black and white too. Black and white photography, yes. Um, the type treatment looks old fashioned in a way. So why would that be good? Why would it be good to be sort of retro for stoneworks? It's an old, old trade. Yeah, it kind of feels like old world trade. Uh, and there's another sort of belief like craftsmen used to be better in the olden days uh, than they are today. So if you're sort of hooking onto that, uh, they may be using laser technology, but what they're focused on in this communication is old world craftsmanship, right? You see the stone colored paper? It's, it's quite well done actually, this whole package, I think. Here's a dentist. What's your feeling with this dentist? It's very bright and vibrant. Yes. I would say it's too informal. Too informal for a dentist. Yeah, uh, they're kind of funny. Unless it's for kids. Jokes, yeah, maybe for kids. But I, Valentina, I feel like you. Like, I don't want my dentist to be funny. I want them to be competent. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> it almost uh, looks like a TV show, like, with... Yeah, it looks like, you know, like something like from Price is Right or something like that. Right, <laughs> like from, from the yeah. 50s or 60s or something. Yeah. Maybe if um, they didn't, if they take the yellow out, use yes. it to the blues. But I think the yellow is what... It's... Yellow and teeth, you don't want that. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I think they're trying to do, I, I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to make the dentist seem uh, more approachable by being fr funny. And they temper the funniness by using very serious type choices. Like it looks like very declarative, strong, all caps and stuff, but they're saying funny things. And I agree, the, de the yellow is a poor color choice for a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> it's well designed, but I think some of the branding is off. And like the background, like it looks like small computer screens too. Like if you look at the envelope, to me, it just yes. doesn't seem to fit with dentist. Yeah. Well, it looks like a uh, model plane instructions or something. <laughs> you this this uh, grid paper. Yeah. So again, I think it's well designed, but the brand is off. Oops. Uh, back here. All right. So when you do these design elements, you're doing them for print, essentially, even though we won't be actually printing them. Um, the way you're setting them up is as if you're going to print them. Uh, so as a result, you have three important crop lines in each of the elements. Uh, the inside line is what we call the safety, type safety. Everything that's really important, like phone numbers and stuff, is to think of it as your margin. That's where you want everything to be inside of. Um, the crop area is where the print, the printer would cut the paper. This is where it gets cut. And this outside line is what we call the bleed and a uh, weird term. But what it means is that if you have a flood color, like if I wanted to fill this with color to the edge, I would actually go past the edge to what we call the bleed. And that enables the printer, the, the machine will not always cut exactly right. So if it bounces around a little bit, there's no chance of getting like a little white edge where the color didn't reach. Uh, and this is standard setup for all printed materials. So uh, if you don't have a bleed, if you don't have color going to the edge, you don't have to worry about the outside line, uh, just the cut line and then the safety. Uh, but certainly if you're putting color all the way to the edge, you wanna make sure it goes beyond the edge to the bleed. So these are how the templates are set up, and that's how they would have to be set up if you were actually going to press. Any questions about this, as I just talked about? No. No? All right. It's pretty clear. And I think Omar goes through it in the videos that you'll see as well. So, Are those set up as guidelines, or is there, are they, like, should we turn them off when we send it? I see, say, 
delete the layer, they're, but they are guides. They are guides, and uh, you can turn them off. Yes. Okay. But they won't show up when you make a PDF. Right. Okay. Uh, this is all the stuff that could go on a business card, and certainly you would not put everything here. Um, typically, what you want to put is the person's name and title, and then all this other information would be sort of grouped together. The well, the company name would be in the logo, but the address, phone number, email, and web address could all could it group together. Uh, so, from a hierarchy standpoint, company name and the logo would be big. Their name, their title, and then the rest. Uh, keep it simple. You don't have to go crazy with this. There are certain elements that you'll create that will help sort of tie it together. Uh, patterns, um, color choices, gradients even, you can use that. Uh, so what you, the sort of visual language you create will tie it together. Don't do a lot of fancy type drop shadows and things like that. Uh, and what everyone does when they make letterhead for the first time is they take their logo, they make it like 10% opacity and fill up the middle of the page. Don't do that. That's sort of imitating what we call a watermark. And it's kind of old fashioned, doesn't really work. And it sort of clutters up the page with a lot of dirt in a way. Just think of it as a frame. So you're creating the frame for a letter. Um, when you look at the envelope, obviously the stamp goes up here. The post office puts a barcode down here. So if you design some big thing down this part, the post office will put a white sticker over it so they can print the barcode. So don't put stuff down there. Typically you put the logo in the upper left and you put the return address either underneath it or in the back on the flap. Uh, the flap, there are two different kinds of flaps. There's a pointed flap and a square flap. Square flap tends to be more formal, sort of business-like. Pointed seems more friendly. I don't know. I don't know why. It just is. Uh, so you can put the return address on the flap if you want. Uh, the letterhead gets the logo, the address, the phone number, and web address. No person's name or, you know, other information. The envelope generally just gets a logo on the address, maybe the web address. So keep it legible and simple. You're trying to accomplish a lot with a little. It's what you're really doing this week. Some more examples. So this one, you see they use this craft paper as a graphic element, almost that ties it in uh, with these bright colors. And then they have a pattern, a couple patterns that are kind of interesting to tie it together. Patterns are allowed. Uh, Lucky Bucket Brewing, they did this uh, wax seal. Uh, there's a kind of cool type treatment there and the orange color this flap they created like a little ribbon it's kind of retro uh this one they use this sort of stone color paper and then this bright yellow so interesting contrast um the logo itself is kind of this arrow and so they made the business cards die cut in the shape of an arrow this company capture studios they have sort of a three icon logo there it is there, and there it is on the back flap. Uh, they used a little pattern to tie around the front to back. Interesting. They put the information vertically, which is acceptable. I'm not a big fan of that, but it makes it a little hard to read. Uh, this piece is really nice. It's for Charleston, naturally. It's the Charleston, uh, South Carolina. You see these lines here? What does this look like, these lines right here on the bottom of the letterhead? Waves. Yeah, it looks like waves, like gentle waves in the Bay of Charleston. Uh, if you take them and you turn them upright, they look like seagrass now. Uh -huh. It has a wonderful, Very it's a wonderful here. graphic element, ties together, right? What'd you say, Zach? I said it's very common here. I'm in South yes. Carolina. <laughs> oh, all right. Seagrass. So you're familiar with Charleston? Oh, yeah. Yeah, today on campus, I asked if anybody had been to Charleston, and no one had. They all looked at me with blank stares. I'm like... They have the best food in the United States in Charleston. <laughs> yeah, I work at the air base there. Um, but the seagrass is, if you go down on this pier, they have guys that actually tie um, like little roses uh, out of the seagrass and try to sell it for like a buck. Oh, Jeez. really? Yeah. Um, 
if you see this recycled paper is sort of a texture, uh, it kind of fits with this Charleston naturally. The logo, if you look at it closely, is actually, it looks like a crane, but it's actually two leaves. Um, there's this sort of gentle green printing right there. There's very subtle, kind of nice, natural. Uh, when you look at the business card, they blind embossed it, which means they press into the paper with no ink, the logo. And this looks like you'd find it on the beach, right? Almost looks like a sand dollar. Yeah, like a sand dollar or something. Uh, so it's a very successful identity package because it really brings about the elements, but it's clean and simple. There aren't a lot of things going on. Here's a student example. This is uh, Nick's, or excuse me, Chase's, uh, Chase Morgan. He did uh, Mount Sapo Soap. Uh, there's his logo in color. So this is where you're at right now. You're like figuring out your final logo in black and white in color, uh, you're gonna create um, this color relationship page. So this is a page in your presentation template and there's a video that shows you exactly how to do this. But you're gonna take your assigned color and place it here and figure out all the color relationships to it. And the purpose of this is really just more or less an exploratory to figure out your palette. So you won't use this as your palette, but this will be sort of a first step and sort of looking at it. You might say, wow, I really like the pentagram, but I'm gonna take out this green and put a different color there. Or maybe I use two of the colors and two different colors. Uh, it's up to you. In Chase's case, uh, here I'll show you a little strategy here. First of all, no white or black. He used white, points off for that. Um, he, this is his assigned color. There's the complement. There's a tint of his assigned color. Uh, here's sort of a greenish color, I think, taken from the tint, like sort of a split complementary type thing. And then he used white. Uh, white and blue are the colors of the Greek flag, so I think that's what he's going for. But don't use white or black. Four How many colors, colors do we have to use? You have to use a total of five. So your assigned color plus four. Now, you may not use all these colors to start but I want you to come up with a palette of five colors that work. The way you okay. do this is you design your graphic, your identity package. You experiment a lot with a lot of colors. And when you finally figure out what you really like, you can then identify those colors and put them into this spec sheet. Uh, start with the Pantones. So identify what your Pantone colors are and then back go, go backwards through the CMYK and the RGB and all this stuff is available in Illustrator and the video by Omar will show you how to do this. So this is what we do as designers all the time. We spec color palettes. I can show you, I'll show you one of mine recently. Uh, Are we free to use uh, Adobe Color? Uh, you may, I, I will allow that because it's a modern tool now. It's kind of, I feel like it's a little bit of cheating, but. <laughs> But I want you to think about, I want you to come up with multiple color palettes and try to experiment to find out what works best for your uh, brand. Um, yeah. uh, this is a brand guide for a uh, dog spa I did, Duke Southpaw. Um, but let's see, get to the, there, there's the color palette. Uh, so I have Pantone colors and hex numbers. Uh, I didn't do the CMYK breakdown. Oh yeah, I did. We started to, they didn't need it. Uh, but you can see, and we actually, yeah. So for this purple, there was no Pantone match that fit perfectly. So we used the CMYK breakdown, uh, for that. And we called it Duke's purple because it was a special purple. Um, but all the rest are Pantone numbers, and then there for the web there was uh, hex numbers. But um, like I said, this is what we do as designers all the time. Um, going forward, business card, name, title, all the info, nice. letterhead, envelope. And then you have a Photoshop mock-up template that you can use to create the whole thing. Now, when you look at it in this template, you should say, there's a brand, there's a look, a feel to this that seems consistent, 
right? That's your goal by Sunday. So everything I just showed you is what to do by Sunday. Any questions at this moment? Nope. No, all good. There's the template like I showed you earlier. Yeah, more. All right, remember these, hue, saturation, brightness, temperature. These are the levers you get to use to create a unique color palette. Uh, starting with the hue, maybe you go to the complement, maybe you desaturate the hue, the, the, the assigned color, change the brightness a little bit, and you can bend the temperature like a warm, like does your palette have an overall warm feeling or an overall cool feeling? Uh, so you're thinking about these elements as you create your palette, hue, saturation, brightness, and temperature. Um, look at nature for inspiration. From now on, as designers, you will be looking at color palettes all the time. You'll see them everywhere, in video games, in movies, at the store, uh, all around you, even in nature. Um, you can look at great photography. There's Annie Leibovitz. Uh, you can look at uh, fashion. The world of fashion is full of amazing color. Uh, you should start to understand what people are doing with color all around you. Um, if you look at the great masters like Matisse, Matisse said, when I put colors together, they have to join a living chord, like a musical chord or harmony. Um, and interestingly, you know, color is light vibration and sound is vibration. So it kind of makes sense. There's like a certain kind of amazing coalition of color when it comes together. Matisse's work was influenced greatly by his proximity to the Mediterranean, I believe. Uh, a lot of bright colors. Um, he was a prolific artist and did these amazing like little watercolor sketches. Whenever he could, he was doing something. Um, in contrast, here is uh, Andrew Wyeth, who was from New England, which is nothing like the Mediterranean. Uh, New England has sort of a dismal landscape in some places. Uh, winter there can be harsh. This is a painting. Has it, anybody seen this painting before? Yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, Sahara and Valentina have seen it. It's called Christina's World, mm -hmm. and it portrays Christina Olson, his neighbor, who was unable to walk. Um, and there's a compelling composition here with the barn off in the distance and the girl sort of leaning forward toward it. Um, but what I want you to look at is this grass, this sort of winter grass, uh, which seems kind of dull, kind of, you know, you know, it's winter time, this kind of brown. But if you look closely, you'll see this incredible variety of color that he's using. There's greens, there's orange, pink, uh, yellows. Uh, this is painted on a hardwood board, and he actually sort of scratched in the grass into the color. Can Thank you see you that? The roof. What, what, Willie? I think he forgot the roof on the barn. The roof on this barn? This barn. Oh, that barn. I think the angle is such you really don't see the roof. Yeah, that's the farmhouse. Oh. There's the barn. There's the plow. Uh, yeah, it's this is a great lesson in composition. I mean, because the, the elements just, you know, create drama and point you in the right direction. Um, here's a painting by Bierstadt. Uh, he was an, a German-American immigrant, came to America in the 1840s and went out to the American West and painted these incredible large-scale canvases, 15, 20 feet tall, giant nice. paintings of the American West. Uh, as he was famous for this kind of luminance, like creating this l amazing light that seemed, you know, this is from the days when there was no, there were no screens, there wasn't any electric light for most of the time. Um, and uh, his paintings really captivated people's imaginations and made them want to go to the American West. Um, and they were all real scenes of, Amer of, uh, of the Western United States. Um, Gauguin uh, from France, another impressionist, Fauvist maybe. Uh, Gauguin was a bank teller at age 40 and his father considered him a failure because he was supposed to go to law school and he never did. So all of a sudden he decided to become a painter and he went to Tahiti. 
uh, if you see this painting, so it's under a canopy on a deck, right? So these are wooden boards here. But if you look at these wooden boards, look at the amazing amount of color in here. Lavender, pink, blue, periwinkle. Uh, and yet they still sort of read as wood. It's reflected, bounced light uh, from some of the uh, garments that the people are wearing and the background. Uh, really incredible color being used there. I mean, even her foot, it has green and red and brown and yellow. Here's some more Gauguin. This work's really uh, compelling. Uh, yeah, Van Gogh's brother uh, paid him to come live with Van Gogh and teach him how to paint. <clears throat> All right, so think about your inspiration. So what do you do for inspiration? Number one is look at your keywords in your creative brief. The keywords should guide you in your color palette. When you look at your color palette, it should reflect those keywords, right? Um, five colors is what you got to have. So you're assigned color plus four others. That's what you're working toward. Uh, again, a good strategy right off the bat, take a compliment, take a tint, take a shade, take a shade of the compliment. That's a color palette. Uh, it doesn't necessarily match your keywords or work perfectly in every design, so then you alter it. You try something else. Uh, once you get your color palette established, then you're going to go back and fill in that uh, spec sheet. Think about the relationship of the colors, just like they're a family, right? So which one's the black sheep? Which one's the wild one? Which one's the hero? The hero should be your assigned color. you got to figure out how to make that work. Contrasting hues always help. Like go go for the compliments. See what that works. How that works. <laughs> Temperature, warm and cool as well. Uh, make sure your color, your assigned color, is the hero. We talk about hierarchy in design, and generally, what does hierarchy mean in design? Come on, Willie. You know. Size difference? Size difference, that's a good answer. So it tends to be like the biggest thing on the page is the most important. That's how hierarchy works, right? Uh, but not in color. In color, the smallest thing on the page can be the most important. Um, what draws this is your eye the work first? Of, what did you say? Uh, what, uh, it's to help guide your eyes, so it's what draws your eye first would be the highest Correct. Part of your hierarchy. Yeah, so it could be size, but in this case it's color. Uh, this is the work of Jessica Heath. She's a great type designer. It says, good morning. And your eye goes right to the focal point, that cup of coffee. Uh, it can create drama. Focus your attention. You're also using light <coughs> and shadow to draw attention as well. Um, and experiment. I want you to try lots of colors. This is the fun part of color theory. This is where the rubber meets the road. So you have a whole week to work this out, um, try things and try them again. Um, in using Illustrator, there's a lot, you can create a lot of color palettes really quickly. So have at it. Things that you think would work, maybe you don't, and other things you didn't think would work well. Like this is another Jessica Quiche piece, and you see she's got sort of orange and a red, and then this blue, which seems like a weird a choice but it somehow works because it creates a high contrast from the the orange and the orange and the uh, purple color sort of seem to be more analogous and then there's this crazy wild card uh again a sort of blue and green that sort of analogous and then a pop of red as a contrast uh you're familiar with the story of matilda yep yeah so she lived in a world that was sort of gray, blackboard, uh, difficult school and all that. And then she created magic in front of that, which you see in all these bright colors. So it's sort of positioning everything, how they all kind of work together. Uh, you can create a whole color palette that makes white sort of an accent. And when you think about colors, they can you be used to organize things, to do varieties, flavors, different flavors different varieties, different kinds of coffee. 
this madcap coffee, they sort of use black as a uniting element, but it works. When you get all done, find your Pantone colors. That's going to be your start. And then add in the others. And here it is again, just so you remember, hue, saturation, brightness, and temperature. Those are the things you're playing with. I already went through this. So um, yeah, contrasting hues, interesting colors. This is your chance. Um, focal point, see this demonstrates that sort of focal point again. Uh, gradients are great. This is uh, Jessica Heesh again. This gradient goes from one complement to another, which would generally mean the middle should be mud, and somehow it works. She made it, this is a very carefully done gradient. It goes from orange to blue. Uh, so gradients, patterns, those are all your friends. Uh, when you look at your logo, you may need to create a version that has that works on a dark background, because you may have a dark background at some point. Uh, Pantone, I talked about that. All right, so that's the end of my lecture. Uh, does that leave you wanting more? Any questions? Nope, I'm pretty much ready to start. <laughs> yes, that's good. I want you to be excited. This is the fun part. Uh, creating your logo is a lot of work, right? Now you've created essentially your own coloring book and you get to play. So think of this week as the play with color week. And we're just taking uh, one logo, correct? This yes, week. you've got to identify your final logo. I will try to provide feedback uh, early tomorrow on, uh, I'll create, I'll do have another video feedback. The last time it didn't work for some reason. I don't know, Did you, was anybody able to look at the video feedback from the discussion? I was able to access it on the YouTube link that you gave us. Right, okay. So that YouTube channel, I've, t I've learned to just sort of put everything there because if FSO fails us, we can always go to YouTube, which generally doesn't fail us, but sometimes there's operator error on my part. Um, I'll just show you quickly kind of what things might be like. All right, since we have a couple minutes, I'll just show you. So. I don't want to update now. Remind me later. All right. Uh, yeah, here's that Duke's color palette. Um, so I, this is how I would work on color. So I would make some circles in Illustrator. Uh, I'm just going to make uh, five circles, right? And then uh, say I had this assigned color, and then I might... Uh, uh, Click happy. I changed the settings on my mouse. Uh, this one, this one, this, oops, this one, and uh, how about that? All right. Uh, I don't like the strokes on those. I'm going to take that off of all of them. Oops. The stroke, not everything else. All right. So say this was my assigned color and I say, okay, well, here's some other colors. Does this really work? I would look at my keywords and decide, but then uh, you can go here, select all of this and go to our recolor artwork tool, which is so helpful. I click on that and I get this dialog box, which if you want to get really familiar with this, it's really helpful. Um, it has an edit tab. So I'm click on the edit tab and it shows me the color wheel right? And, and in fact, it almost shows me my color relationships here as well, right? So uh, let's say I was like, well, I want, uh, I don't like this violet color. Maybe I want a sort of analogous more palette. So I'm going for that green. Uh, I can change the brightness and saturation. So maybe I make that a little brighter. Uh, maybe make this uh, a little lighter, paler creating kind of a subtle palette for that bright red. Um, but if I like this, I click on this little folder here and look what it did. It made me a color palette and I could call this whatever I want, summertime. Uh, if I say, okay, I say, yes, save it. 
Now, when I go to my swatches, look what's there, summertime. Uh, so you could see I could create 10, 15 color palettes in a matter of minutes just by playing with that element. Uh, now, once uh, I got this, I could actually apply it to a logo. Yeah, I'll just use this as an example. I'm going to copy this over to this other document. All right, so say I want to apply that color palette. Well, I can just quickly, it looks terrible, but uh, I could quickly sort of uh, grab this and just start um, applying, uh, let's say ungroup it. So I could pick this and say, I want this to be this color in the fill. Uh, maybe I want this violet color. I'm going to so select same fill color and hit the eyedropper and make it red. And I've created a mess in a hurry. But anyway, I'm just showing you how the tools work. Um, but you get the idea so that you could actually create uh, a lot of options and uh, oh so how okay nick's asking how do i get to the recolor artwork so when you select a group of objects like i select these circles it pops up automatically it's a contextual menu they call it uh, and it looks like a little pizza and you click on that and there's a lot to understand here uh, so what it initially shows you is if it was going to remap the color from this, currently it's going to the same because I haven't told it to go to a different color. I could say, change it to brights and it would remap these colors accordingly, right? Uh, okay. Like I could grab this whole logo, recolor and say, use that. Uh, here you have the option to uncheck black and white so it'll change black and white as well. Uh, now I could say, well, I don't, I want this green to be, uh, that green. So it's the same. Um, and the white will be yellow. Yes. I think it's incredibly ugly, but anyway. Thank you for sharing. All right. So I hope that's helpful. We'll get you started. Um, as I said, so once you create some color palettes, you're going to try them out see if they work. Design your business card, letterhead, envelope. Uh, give yourself a lot of options. Uh, post them to the discussion. If you have anything done by Wednesday at noon, I'll take a look. And even if you don't and you just want to join me at lunchtime and say hello, that's okay too. Uh, ask me questions, whatever you need. So should I release you into the night? Go work. Go back to work, some of you. <laughs> Here for Where's another 24 hours. <laughs> All right, guys. Keep doing the great work you are. I look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much.